Hi, and welcome to lesson six of our um, lesson using context clues to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. So let's dive in. This is from our I Ready Student at Home activity packet for grade four. So by now you should have already read Over Bridge Under Tunnel. Lesson six has us to write a short response. And I'm just going to jump down to number four so we'll know what we're talking about. Write a definition of the word subterranean. Okay, so that's the word that they want us to respond to. What do they want us to do? We need to identify the context clues that were found to help us to determine the meaning of this word. They want us to I'm going to use another color. We need to describe the strategy that we use to figure out the meaning of the word. And then we need to support it with details from the text. Okay, so the authors have presented us with a chart to help us to sort out our thinking, organize our thinking. So the first part of the chart says helpful context. So what sentences or paragraphs of the text can help us to determine the meaning of our word subterranean? Given those contexts, what clues could we pull from those sentences? In the last box, based on our clues that we pull from our context, what could be a possible meaning of the word subterranean? So that's what we're aiming for, okay? So, if we refer back to our text, we could find the word subterranean on page 19. So, let us find that word subterranean. There it is. Okay. So, let's read. Of course, not even the world's most famous tunnels get many visitors who just want to look. It's hard to get a good view of a subterranean passage, but since the Channel Tunnel opened in 1994, it has transported millions of people. The Channel Tunnel or Channel runs beneath the English Channel and connects France and England. The Channel is a rail tunnel. The only automobiles that cross it are carried on special railway cars. The channel is not the longest tunnel in the world, but it is one of the few tunnels that connect two countries. Okay, so we have a word subterranean. Hmm. So using context clues, I know that I should look around my unfamiliar word. And let me go to the sentence before. Of course, not even the world's most, most famous tunnel gets many visitors who just want to look. Well, not too many context clues that support my word subterranean right now. But if I look at my word subterranean, using my background knowledge, I know that sub means something that is less than or under. So maybe I can use that part. And then I know that terranean base word is terrain, which has something to do with land. So let me keep reading. But since the Channel Tunnel opened in 1994, it has transported millions of people. Hmm. So underneath land and it's a passage that is transporting people, okay? The Channel Tunnel or Channel runs, oh, look at here. It runs beneath the English Channel, and it connects France and England, okay? So it runs beneath the English Channel, and it connects these two places. The Channel is a rail tunnel, okay? So there's that word tunnel again. So I'm going to connect those two, tunnel to tunnel, tunnel to tunnel. 
tunnel if I think about what the word tunnel means I know that means digging and it has something to do if I'm digging it must mean that I'm going underneath something which takes me back to my word sub okay let's keep reading the only automobiles that cross it are carried on special railway cars the channel is not the longest tunnel in the world but it is one of the few tunnels that connect two countries okay so there are two countries being connected and those two countries were France and England so let's go back and look at finding our best context clues so we have and I'm going to use another color we have subterranean which is our base word and I have sub and I have terranean I know it has something to do with a tunnel and that it runs beneath something okay so maybe I have enough information to start building my written response helpful context clues hmm what were my context clues and possible meaning for that unfamiliar word subterranean let's look so in sentence three of um, that paragraph that I just read on page 19 sentence 3 has something to do with transporting people and then sentence 4 it tells me that it runs beneath the channel okay so transporting runs beneath if I put those two context clues together I can probably figure out that this subterranean means that it is something that goes underground so subterranean means that it goes underground and being that it's a tunnel it's a passageway that transports so it's a type of transportation system that goes underground so my possible meaning for subterranean means underground so let me refer back to my instructions write a definition of the word subterranean identify the context clues you found describe the strategy used to figure out the meaning of the word and use details from the text to support your response so below I have it broken down subterranean means I know this based on my context clues and what strategies did I use and what was my support so a possible written response can look something like this subterranean is used to describe tunnels which the text tells are passageways underground under the ground i use a positives to check my understanding according to the text on page 19 the channel is used to carry people between places or as it said in the text countries oh this boy has a typo right there so I'm going to take that out between countries the author explained that the channel tunnel or channel which is my appositive appositives are examples set off by commas so here's my positive which is my strategy and it tells that it runs beneath the English Channel and connects France and England. So here's my support. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this explanation on how we can develop a written response based on the context clues that we found in our text. So watch out for our next video on lesson seven which continues with using context clues to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words all right talk to you later bye bye hi guys and welcome back to lesson seven of our already student at home activity packet for grade four our lesson today is a continuation of using context clues to help us to determine the meaning of un familiar words so let's dive in our article today is seashells seashells um, for the purpose of this lesson 
we are going to explore the questions and the answer choices together but i'm not reading the article to you but i do want to call your attention to some of the text features that the author presents to help us to better understand what we're reading so some of those text features are seashells the title we have bolded print we have our illustration to let us know that these seashells may be found along beachy areas or seashore areas and we have side a sidebar that the author wants us to draw attention to certain words like series hinged and foreign on the next page we have the subheading univales univales by now you should have read that univales are mollusks that have one shell or shell that is found in one piece there it is in the text and it, the author also presents us with photographs to help us to gain a better understanding of what some of these mollusks may look like and we have a worm shell we have a slipper shell we have a helmet shell and at the bottom we have a Avalon shell. On the next page, we have the subheading bivalves. Through your reading, you should have read that bivalves are mollusks that have shells in two parts. Some of our uh, mollusks that the author presents us via photograph are angel wing shells, the jackknife shell, this big picture in the middle here, the giant oyster shell. And again, another text feature are the photographs and we also have the labeling of the photographs. So we'll know exactly what we are looking at. At the top, we have the kitten's paw shell and at the bottom we have the pearl oyster shell. Let's dive in and look at these questions. So, I start at number one. It says, read the sentence from paragraph one in the passage. The shells save them from predators such as starfish, birds, and otters. The question is, what does the author suggest to the reader by using the word predator? And we need to pick two answer choices. Predators can harm some animals. Well, from what I understand about the word predators, I know that that could be true. So I mark that with a question mark and an MB for maybe. Whatever you feel comfortable with, you can use a question mark or you can mark it with the letters MB. I know most of us at um, Arlington use the letters MB. So whatever you feel comfortable with. B, predators can find shelter from the storms. Well, that's not what that sentence read above at the top. So. I don't think that's the best answer. C, an animal shell helps protect it. Maybe. D, all predators have skeletons. That's not what that sentence said. Or E, when the animal dies, the shell remains. That sentence didn't read and it didn't tell us anything about that. So that can't be my best answer. So by now, I hope you have your best two answers. So moving forward, I will talk you through it, but I'm not text marking any um, other questions. I want you to, um, or any of the answer choices, I want you to use your process of elimination to determine which are your best answer choices. Here we go. Question number two. This question has two parts. First answer part A, then answer part B. Part A. What is the meaning of the word iridescent? And I've already highlighted that as used in paragraph four. They've told us what paragraph to look in, so you need to be looking in paragraph four. Is it A, not letting light through? B, easy to notice or understand? C, shining with many varying colors? Or D, a small amount of something? Okay, I hope you've selected your best answer choice as it relates to how the word iridescent is used in paragraph four. Let's go to part B. Which phrase from the passage helps the reader understand the meaning of iridescent? The meaning of iridescent. So here we go. Is it A, next largest groups, group of mollusks? Is it B, have small holes in their shells? Is it C, the inside of, of abalone shell? 
or is it D gleams with different rainbow colors? Okay, I hope you've chosen your best answer for part B. Remember, when your question has two parts, both parts must be answered correctly in order for you to get credit for that one question. Let's move on. Number three. Number three also has two parts. So first answer part A, then answer part B, but both must be correct. Part A. What is the meaning of the word bivalves, bivalve, as it is used in paragraph five? So they told me the word and where to look. Is it A, having a hard outer shell? B, having a shell with two pieces? C, having a soft outer shell? Or D, having a shell that is all one piece? Okay, I hope you found your best answer. Part B. Underline the two phrases. Oh, I know that I must have two phrases underlined. I cannot only have one phrase. If I only choose one phrase, then my question is wrong. If I choose three phrases, then my question is still wrong because Directions told me to choose two phrases, and I don't want to confuse my grader, my person who's looking at my paper. So it says, underline two phrases in paragraph five. So I know it's, my answers will be in paragraph five that best support your answer to part A. So whatever you chose up here, your answers or your two phrases need to be able to support your answer choice up here. Okay, and because this has more than one punctuation at the end or end mark, all my friends have to read this by themselves. Okay, so find your two best phrases that support your answer choice in part A. Let's go to number four. Read the sentence from the passage. The jackknife clam has an appropriate name because it has about the same shape as a closed jackknife. What does the author tell the reader by using the word appropriate? So what is the author trying to tell me by using that word appropriate? And again, the author wants me to select two supporting choices. Here we go. Is it A, bivalves are the largest group of mollusks? B, jackknife describe the shape of the clam? Again, excuse me, B, jackknife describes the shape of the clam. Is it C, an angel wing is a good name for the clam? Hmm. But if I look back at my sentence, my sentence is talking about a jackknife clam, not an angel wing. So I know that can't be the, a good choice. Is it D, jackknife is a good name for the clam? Is it E, the clam looks like an open jackknife? Or is it F, a jackknife folds into its own case? Have you found your two best answers? I hope so. All right. So that concludes lesson seven. Our next video will be on lesson eight, which will be our written response for using context clues to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. So I hope that you've enjoyed lesson seven. All right. Until next time, take care. Bye bye. Hi and welcome back for lesson eight of our already student at home activity packet for grade four. Today's lesson, we will look at developing a short written response for our skill that we've been working with using context clues to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. Basically in today's um, lesson, we are supporting our unfamiliar word or our word that is used in the sentence. So let's look at our directions. 
says that, and I'm going to cross out the bottom portion. Let me go back. We're crossing out the bottom portion because we're not doing the learning target today. Draw a line through that. Okay. So our short response, questions that we need to respond to. What does the author tell the reader by using the underlying word in the sentence below from paragraph eight? So here is our sentence. And I think I'm going to go and highlight it with a green color. Draw some attention to it. Looks like Christmas. Okay, let's go back to my marker, my pen. So let's go back and reread that. What does the author tell the reader by using the underlying word in the sentence below from paragraph eight? The next question, how do the details in the paragraph further develop this idea that the pearl is an accident. And the next is a statement which it tells us to include one or more context clues from the text to support your written response. Remember, we always have to refer back to the text to support our written response. Whatever position we take, it has to be attributed or found in the text okay let's move on so the author told us or the question told us that we're going to look in paragraph eight so we found paragraph eight and i uh, made a copy for the purpose of this powerpoint so that you can refer to it and in looking in paragraph eight we're looking for the sentence that talks about the pearl being an accident so, go look at the first sentence, nothing there. Second sentence has the word pearls, but nothing about accident. And there it is in our third sentence. A pearl is an accident. Highlight that. I've already underlined that, so I'm going to highlight it, that a pearl is an accident. Well, let's go on and continue reading. A grain of sand or something else gets inside the oyster shell. So something enters that shell. The oyster is creating a, is creating new material all the time. Hmm. Sidebar, side note. To protect itself, oh, it's protecting itself from the foreign body. The oyster covers it with the same material that the oyster's shell is made of. The result is a pearl. Here we go. So as I look at this paragraph, I notice a type of text structure, structure, or how the author organizes information. Can you guess what I'm thinking? That's right. It's a cause and effect relationship. The cause is that this foreign body, body entered the oyster's shell. And in order for the oyster to protect itself, it covers that foreign body, whether it's a grain of sand or something, in the same material that is found inside of the oyster shell or that the oyster shell is made up of. So we have some information here. We have that the pearl is an accident and we have the cause and effect structure or relationship that the author presents us with. So now we can probably go ahead and relook at our question and prepare to write our written response. Going back to our directions, what does the author tell the reader? So what is the author telling us by the use of this underlying word from paragraph eight? How do the details develop the idea? And we need to support our response. Okay. So a possible, go ahead and cross that out. Possible written response or example will be something like this. The author is telling the reader that pearls are not made on purpose. That supports the thought that pearls are an accident. So Let's read that again. The author is telling the reader that pearls are not made on purpose by an oyster. In the sentence after, 
a pearl is an accident. The author says that a grain of sand or something else gets inside the oyster shell. The oyster does what? Tries to protect itself from the foreign material by doing what? Wrapping it with the same material found inside of the shell. So this is our written response to the question that was presented. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson on supporting unknown words or words that are found in the text via a written response based on our context clues that we found inside of the text. So until next Please come back and join me for lesson nine, which is a review of using context clues. So until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Welcome back for lesson nine of our iReady Student at Home Activity Packet for grade four. Today's lesson is a recap of the various strategies used to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. So far, they've learned three different ways. For lesson nine in your packet, this is an activity for the parents and the child to do together. So what the purpose of this lesson is, is just a re quick recap of the various strategies that the students should have already learned. So strategy one, talks about the different types of um, context clues. One is a definition and you have an example and what it does. The next is an appositive. You have an example and again what it does. I believe I use an appositive in um, lesson seven in which it was marked off with commas and it had the example right there in the middle and a positive. The next type of context clue is the presentation of examples. So you have it used in sentences and it tells what it is explicitly by giving different types. And our next type of context clue is contrast. The kids should know that a contrast means the opposite or a difference. So for the purpose of this lesson, we're talking about opposites. So we have it used in, in an example and it tells what that contrast actually does. 20 to 30 minutes, you can explore this type of use of context clue with any of the previously read um, articles regarding context clues that we've used for lesson six through eight. The next strategy is identify paragraph or text based context clues. Readers have to read sentences around unfamiliar words to gain a better understanding of what that unfamiliar word may mean. So guiding questions when reading a text and presented with an unfamiliar word is, what is the paragraph really about? Do the sentences around the unfamiliar word describe it in a different way? For example, by giving a synonym or an example or by showing a contrast. Next question, can I make an educated guess or inference about what the word could mean? Another question, guiding question, if I replace the word with what I think it might mean, does the sentence make sense with the topic or the purpose of the paragraph? Again, you can as the parent or as a guardian, use and explore this strategy with any of our previously read um, stories or articles 
regarding context clues. And it shows that this should be a 10 to 15 minute activity at home for the students practice. Next strategy. Use multiple meaning words to highlight context. Context clues can help the reader clarify the intended meaning of multiple meaning words. Clarify what these words mean. So just by reading the word in context, that will give a better understanding of how the word is actually used. So the author presents us four words. Here we go. Fan. One example of fan. The fan cheered for her team. So fan is somebody who is supporting a team or a particular side. And another definition is a device. There was only a fan to keep us cool. There was only a fan to keep us cool. So two different meanings. The word fry. The fry swim downstream right after hatching. So we know the fry in this context must mean that it's a type of fish. The next use of fry, my dad will fry potatoes for dinner. Second meaning of the word fry, which is a method used for cooking. Next word is lap. I held the plate in my lap. Okay, so that's one meaning. And then we have another use. We ran one lap around the track. Different meaning of lap. And our last word is strike. Watch the hammer strike the nail. One meaning. And the second meaning, that pitch looks like a strike. Okay. So, with your child, discuss how context clues in each sentence above clarifies the intended meaning of the word. And you can use any of our um, text to see if the child can find or your child can find multiple meaning words and have them to explain how it is used in context and if they can come up with another meaning of that same word. All right, so this activity should take you about 10 to 15 minutes. Remember, you have additional instructions at the bottom of how you can apply or practice the use of multiple meaning words to highlight context using context clues. Okay, so until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Hi, and welcome back for lesson 10 of our iReady Student at Home Activity Packet, grade four. Today, we are working on using a dictionary or a glossary. Let's look at the introduction. There are many places you can look to find information about words. One of those places is called a dictionary. What is a dictionary? A dictionary is a list of words in alphabetical order. Each entry has an entry word, it has a pronunciation, it has a part of speech, and it has the meaning of the words. So let's look at this dictionary entry for the word break. The pronunciation uses special symbols to show how to say the word. So here is our pronunciation. And then we have the part of speech. So we have break could be a verb. I don't like that color. Let me go back. We have break can be a verb or we have break can be a noun. So that's the part of speech. We have the pronunciation. When there is more than one meaning, each definition is numbered. So when we see those numbers, we know that there must be more than one 
meaning to that word. Okay. Sometimes a sample sentence helps make the meaning of a word or phrase clearer. Sometimes we're presented with a sample sentence. Same color, so we need to choose a different color. Sample sentence. So for number three, it says to do better. Anna broke the record for the high jump. So there is our word used in a sentence to clarify that meaning. All right, our next type of resource is called a glossary. A glossary, let me change colors. A glossary is a kind of dictionary often found where? In the back of a book. So a dictionary is a book by itself and a glossary is found in the back of a book. It lists important words from the book in alphabetical order, just like our dictionary. It's in alphabetical order. And it gives the meaning of each word as it's used in that book. So just like our dictionary, it gives the meaning of words. Okay. So let's look at our glossary below. We have the word carry. And just like our dictionary, our glossary has its pronunciation spelled out with our special characters. And it has, sometimes words have more than one meaning, therefore we have our numbering of our different meanings. And what I don't see down here is a sample sentence. So. Let's go into our guided practice. But before we start our guided practice, let's read our hint. It says to find the right meaning of the word or phrase, read all the definitions first. Decide which meaning makes the most sense in the sentence. Reading the directions. Read the paragraph. Use the entry above to find the meaning of the underlying word and phrases. Underlying words and phrases. Write the number, so this is what we need to do. Write the number of the correct meaning above each word or phrase. That's what I need to do. Put a star there. Okay, let's go. Hank Aaron broke into Major League Baseball in the 1950s. So I'm going to go back up to my dictionary entry and I'm going to find break into. And the best meaning of break into would be number three. He started a new job. He broke into acting. Well, no, he broke into Major League. So that will be number three. of the phrase. I'm going to put a P for phrase. The next sentence, a big break came for him in 1954 when he replaced an injured player. Well, break in this sentence is used as a noun. So let me go back up to my noun section and the best definition would be look. So I'm going to put a number five there. I'm going to put an N for noun. So it'll make it easier to go back and find where I found my information at. The next sentence, Aaron's talent helped him break Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs. Break. So I know that he did something. So I'm going to look at my verb section of my word. Break to smash. No. To do... To disobey? No. To do better than? Yes. So three. And I'm going to put a V for verb because I know it's a verb. Next sentence. When Aaron hit his 715th home run, his fans broke into cheers. So something that the fans did. So did they smash or did they disobey? Hmm. Break, smash, to disobey. Hmm. 
broke in two. Excuse me. I was in the wrong section. To break in two. One, disturb. Or two, start to do something suddenly. They started to do something suddenly. So I'm going to put a two and put a P for phrase there. And the next one. Aaron carried on hitting home runs until he retired in 1976. Well, should I look in a dictionary? Mm, carry on is not in my dictionary up there. Oh, I need to look in glossary because carry is in glossary. Well, it's not the first one. Let me go to, oh, there it is. The phrase carry on. So. What did he do? Is it one or two? Aaron carried on. Did he continue or did he act decidedly? I think he continued. So I'm going to use one and put a P for phrase there. Okay. So now I've marked up all of my underlined words that was that were used in the text. And I have also coded it with letters so I can go back up to my glossary or my dictionary and easily locate my meaning as it's used um, in the text. All right. I hope that you enjoyed our lesson 10 of using a dictionary or glossary to help define words or to help clarify words that are used in the text. All right. So until next time, take care and keep learning and keep reading. Bye-bye.